everybody. You are listening to a new cast, a weekly podcast that features interviews, discussions, and teaching on various biblical and theological subjects. And we do this because we believe that our minds are to be shaped and renewed by the transforming Word of God through the power of the Holy Spirit. So we pray that for the next few minutes, as you listen, you will see Jesus more clearly. Today on the podcast, we have a returning guest, Mike Beck, is joining us, and we are going to talk about covenant theology again. We've had him on before. And we've talked about covenant theology, and we're going to talk about more covenant theology today. So enjoy. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Renewal Cast. uh, We're going to talk about covenant theology today with Mike Beck. We've talked about covenant theology before with you. Uh, Jay went back and (laughs) and found the dates, July 13th, 2022, and then November 11th in 2020. Yeah, yeah. Um, I feel so, like I feel yeah, like we're we, good. Yeah. We're good friends at this point, man. Yeah, you know, we've had, <laughs> yeah, we've had is, some some solid this conversations. Real. This is real. If only all friends could be like this. <laughs> yeah. This, yeah. this is uh, yeah. It's great. No, it's good um, to see you guys again and um, talk a little bit more about it. I think I think every every single time we come away thinking, oh man, well that hardly even scratched the surface, did it? So so you know, just to press in a little bit more on some of these things is always good. I think. Yeah, we're we're excited to have you on and join us today. And would you just uh, would you just take a little bit of a time and and tell us what's a little bit about yourself, what's been going on in, in yeah. your life and ministry? No problem. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, I am. Uh, I'll tell everyone again in case they they haven't heard my speech Absolutely. before. The uh, you know this the weird South African accent that's happening over here is because I'm from South Africa, right? And it gets really weird because I came to New Zealand to plant a church. And I've been here for the last 18, 19 years. Uh, and I hang a lot, uh, around with a lot of Americans. So, and I watch too many Clint Eastwood movies. So, you know, what does that make my accent? It's like a monster. So just, just uh, so that people you know, can put that to rest and go, right, let's forget about that and move on. But yeah, no, so I am uh, pastoring here full time, teaching at our local uh, college. Uh, in, I'm teaching a Hebrew class and uh, biblical theology. And uh, other than that, just plugging away Sunday after Sunday. We, uh, New Zealand is a interesting place to do ministry. It's a uh, very progressive, especially Wellington. It's kind of the, uh, it's almost like Portland and San Francisco had a baby. That's how I describe <laughs> it to people from, from America. You know, they, it's, it's sort of the, the worst of, of all of those. And if you get my, my meaning there, but, but it's very, very similar to those, those cities and, um, and perhaps with some sugar on top, just in terms of that progressive political element. And so you don't get any much nominalism in Christianity. Uh, it, 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 churches are small. And if they, if they pitch up on Sunday, they, they mean business. They're real Christians. They don't get any props from society to do that. So that's good. You know, it makes uh, pastoring quite pleasant. You know, you know, the people that come to church, they're your guys, you know, and, and, and you really want to serve them well. And so, yeah, we've got a great little church in the heart of the city here. And, and, um, and that's, that's pretty much my, my life. And then I've, I've tried to have just my book has just been published. So that's been, that's been good. Uh, my, my dissertation, I'm married with Klein in the two kingdoms. So uh, other than that, you know, that's kind of what we, we try and think about as much as possible. I, I do run a podcast to age sojourner that takes up some more of the, the remaining time there and, and uh, just try and circulate some of these thoughts and biblical theology and some of the stuff I'm thinking about anyway. And, uh, I suppose at the end of the day, just trying to make the world a slightly more planning in place. You know, if I can do that, then, then uh, yeah, we got to have you back on and talk about your book about halfway yeah. through it. And uh, you can introduce oh, cool. us to Klein. Really? Wow, excellent. Good. <laughs> yeah, good job. I yeah. feel like you need a, a purple heart wow. of bravery for getting halfway through that book. I know it's, it's sort of like a descent into <laughs> darkness as you read. It starts off really well. And then by the, by the middle, it's like, what is, what is even going on here? <laughs> but yeah, no, totally happy to do that if we uh, get some more opportunity down the line. So this week, we want to talk about the Abrahamic Covenant. So you get an opportunity here to settle a question for everybody for all time here. Is the Abrahamic Covenant a covenant okay. of grace? Yes, I know. <laughs> Let's move on. <laughs> all right. Um, four uh, four like, minutes and 24 seconds. That's, the that's some, sort of, some sort of record. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> Is it a covenant of grace? Yeah, I think that, well, I suppose you could approach the, the question negatively and positively you could you could sort of say well uh, it's not a covenant of works and then try and build it from that point or, or you could say well it obviously is a covenant of grace and then therefore not a covenant of works i think probably whoever's listening to this 
you know, they might not be are fair with the latest in covenant theology. So perhaps it's worth just saying there is a bit of a squabble on this issue within all camps, really. It's not just a, a Baptist thing. Well, it's mostly a Baptist thing, I should say, uh, these days. But perhaps it's helpful to ask why someone would even think of the Abrahamic covenant as a covenant works. I mean, let me tilt it in my favor, because I think what happens is people see circumcision. Oh, circumcision. Whoa. And then, of course, circumcision gets gets related to the law a lot. And by the time of the New Testament, circumcision, it seems like it's causing a lot of trouble uh, for Paul and for the church and for legalism and that sort of thing. So circumcision gets introduced in the Abrahamic covenant. So isn't that just immediately something works-ish? And then, of course, you've got the breakability issue, which we have to acknowledge. Uh, the Abrahamic covenant, very clearly breakable. Genesis 15, 14, uh, any uncircumcised male who is not circumcised shall be cut off. He's broken my covenant. You know, there it is. And that I think most readers of the Bible, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll work through the Old Testament. They'll see, all right, there we go. That's the Abrahamic covenant. Got to keep that in mind. Then you get to the new covenant, which is first prophesied in, in Jeremiah, or not first prophesied, but you know what I mean? It's explicitly related them. And there it's spoken of as something that's just not, it's different. It's different. It's unbreakable. And so we're expecting something unbreakable in the new covenant. And so again, you have this kind of, well, maybe that, that means it's, it's, one is a covenant of works, the other one is a covenant of grace, something along those lines. The problem with this whole process of reasoning, though, and I think this really does, it's helpful to say because it gets to the bottom of it at some level, is that you'll have exhibit A over here where we have the covenant of grace. We're saying, okay, behold, the covenant of grace. This is how the covenant of grace is administered, and the covenant of grace is the new covenant, is the way the reasoning is going. That, so, so then we come to exhibit B, which is the Abrahamic covenant. And we see that it is administered differently. So therefore, it's not a covenant of grace because it's not the new covenant. And when you say it like that, it kind of brings out, well, obviously, you know, that's going to be your conclusion. That's not really the way to reason it through, I don't think, uh, because it, it sort of oversimplifies the process. I think that you leave undone at that point this matter of the difference between any of the historical covenants you come across in the Bible which everyone's going to be aware of, like whether you're dispensational or whether you're covenantal, you start in Genesis, you come across these covenants. Everyone agrees that, uh, the, you know, look, there's a covenant happening there. Look, there's another one. Look, there's another one. But none of those are saying covenant of grace, even including the new covenant. It might be obviously a gracious covenant at that point, but it's not, there's no mention of a covenant of grace anywhere. So you, immediately you've got to ask, well, what is this thing when we're talking about a, a covenant of grace? Is how does that relate to the Abrahamic covenant rather than just sort of blur them together without, without uh, any more thought. And then the big one is that you have to be careful that when we're asking the question of whether a covenant is, even if it's not the covenant of grace, is it gracious or is it a works covenant? We're not asking whether it's breakable or whether it's got things attached that you must do or anything like that. All covenants have things like that, even if they're not breakable. But the real question is, what is the principle of inheritance? What is it that will bring me the promise? Uh, is it something that fundamentally is resting on what I must do? Or is it something that will be given to me and then I must do things? What, what's the thing going on in that covenant? That's what you have to ask. So all that by way of preface to you know, why we should see it as a covenant of grace. Because firstly, when we're asking the question, uh, what is a covenant of grace? We're asking a theological question. Uh, I love what, 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 uh, what Sam Waldron says in his exposition of the 1689. He said, the Bible it never actually uses the word covenant to refer to an overarching covenant of grace, which spans the whole of human history. Each use of the term to refer to a divine covenant in the Bible refers to a covenant made by God at some specific historical epoch. None of these covenants may simply therefore be equated with what the confession describes as a covenant of grace. So that, that, that takes that off the table. I'm not saying that that's less true or that's, you know, obviously I believe in the covenant of grace and, and I believe in the systematic construct behind that. But it's like, I think it is wise to just go, this is, this is the exegesis and this is what we're reasoning outwards from based upon that exegesis to this theological idea that is true, but it's not a historical covenant per se that we can point to. And then we're able to go through the historical specifics of each of those covenants and we're able to ask more pointed questions like, not, is it the covenant of grace? Because obviously it's not, but is it gracious or is it works? 
is it a works principle? Is it a grace principle? And we're asking more uh, pointed questions there. I don't know if you feel free, if you got any questions, just shoot. Uh, but I'll just quickly run you, run you through my reasoning and then we can uh, chat about it. You come to, let's say, start in Genesis and you get to Genesis 3 and or even before that, you've got this clear works thing going on, right? So let's say we're not even asking about the theological construct. We're asking, is that original thing going on there with Adam and, and God, is that works-ish or is that gracious-ish? And obviously you've got this do this and live. Don't do this and die. There we go. End of story. That's the works covenant. I mean, you get this thing promised based upon mm -hmm. what you do. And if you don't do it, then you're not going to get it. Like very, very simple. And that is not only exegetically a, a works concept, but it gives rise to the theological covenant of works as well as a construct. I think that's that then is reduplicated or published again in, in the Mosaic covenant. Exegetically, you see this give rise to a kind of uh, works principle. You do this, you're going to get these promises. If you don't do this, well, read Leviticus. You've got all these curses coming upon you. Very clearly, this theological construct in play because of the exegetical reality of a works. Uh, basis. But then you come to Genesis 15, right? And and it's like, immediately you notice that there's something difficult. I mean, I've, I I just un honestly struggle to see how it could be read otherwise, to be perfectly honest with you. There you have God and Abraham, right? <laughs> and uh, you know, the ancient Near Eastern scenario, right? They, they, they make these covenants, the vassal king and the suzerain king. And uh, there they are. They make these vows. They slaughter these animals, the super gruesome scene. And they're walking through saying, all right, this is what I promise to do. These are my terms of the covenant. If I don't do this, then may I be like this animal, basically. May I be slaughtered and so forth. And then both of them walk through and this blood earnest thing is like the paradigm for a covenant of works. So you're expecting a covenant of works. And then, you know, <laughs> what do you have? Like uh, uh, the first bit of uh, anesthetics going on there with, with, with Abraham. He's just put to sleep. And uh, I mean, he is like doing the definitive nun work at that point. He's just sleeping the entire time. And God is, is explicitly taking the whole thing upon himself and saying, I'm going to walk the pathway of blood for you. I mean, this thing is going to happen. The promises are going to be yours, but you're not even in this, you know, like I'm doing it all. I'm taking the, the promise. I'm, I'm making the promise. I'm taking the, the, the curse. Everything, everything is on me. And, uh, and that's why you can be sure that these things will happen. I love what Klein says, one of my favorite little quotes from, from Klein. He says, the covenant was kept and the promises in their ultimate meaning were fulfilled in God's only son, pledging himself to that death, that, that, that malediction, that, that curse. And Christ, therefore, is the surety of the heavenly inheritance for the true seed of Abraham. Like that's why Abraham was confident afterwards. It would happen because God did it. Now, I don't know, how do you get works into that? You know, it's just like, that's the, that's the covenant right there. So that's the first stickler for me, just as you read the Abrahamic covenant itself. And then, of course, you go to the, the New Testament, where if, you, if there was any doubt, Paul just kind of makes this very, very clear all the way through in that he's contrasting the Mosaic with the Abrahamic the whole time as like this antithesis between works and grace. We know the story with, with Galatians, where the, the, all these legalized, uh, legalists, at least, uh, want to come in there and, and they're happy with Jesus. They just want to say, all right, let's get all Jewish. And we just, let's think about Moses. He had blood, blood sacrifices. We got blood sacrifice with Jesus. They had works. We got works. Let's just do works and blood sacrifice, just like Moses did it. And of course, Paul doesn't like that because he's going, well, first, if you want to be Jewish, you're not thinking Jewish enough. Go back to the true father of the Jews and start there. So here we go. Abraham. Now we're back in Genesis 15. And he goes, <laughs> read Genesis 15 and tell me that there are any works. Nope, you can't do it. So yes, the Mosaic covenant came in with its works principle, but that was 430 years later after the covenant was ratified, which is what we've just been talking about. So as Paul says in Galatians 3, uh, verse 8, and the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, thinking about Genesis 12 even, in you shall the nations be blessed. And then he goes uh, uh, later on in, in verse 17, this is what I mean. The law, which came 430 years afterward, does not annul a covenant previously ratified by God so as to make the promise void. For if the inheritance, now you look how this principle is at play for him. All he cares about is the principle of inheritance. For if the inheritance comes by the law, it no longer comes by promise. Right? That's, that's the thing. We're not, is it breakable? Is it unbreakable? Is it this? Is it that? No, it's just, what is the principle of inheritance? either law or promise. And then he says, but God gave it to Abraham by promise, like very clearly. So therefore, 
whatever we're dealing with, with what you guys want to bring in with your mosaic stuff. I mean, that's like seriously not the way that it, it has played out in history. So I think that's a real stickler. I've not yet seen anything that explains that to my satisfaction in terms of how that could, some have tried to say, well, Paul is, he's taking the, the material elements of uh, law and gospel rather than the formal elements and comparing them. But I don't think he's doing that. When he uses the language of ratification here, he's, he's saying formally, the formal Abrahamic covenant is here being contrasted with the formal Mosaic covenant. So materially, sure, like the substance of law and gospel are definitely being com- uh, contrasted, but also as they're contained and enshrined in those covenants. I don't know how you really get away with uh, without that. And I haven't gone into the rest of it. Like, I mean, I think Jeremiah contrasts uh, the Mosaic and, and the Abrahamic. I think that you have Second Corinthians that does the same. I think you could talk about Romans 3, 4, where, where, where it's Abraham, not Moses, held up as the paradigm of the new covenant believer. So I think um, that's my basic case. You know, the law was came 430 years afterwards, but that was, as Paul says, for the sake of driving home this, this reality of, of their sin, to show them their need for grace, that they couldn't do it by works. It wasn't to to in any way um, lessen the, the graciousness of the Abrahamic covenant. And I suppose, you know, there's more we could say, um, but that, that's, that's hopefully that settles it forever, right? That, that must surely settle it forever for everyone, <laughs> without doubt, ever again. I don't know. What's Seems more? clear to me. <laughs> well, yeah, what would be the, the comeback? What would be the, the argument of, of somebody that said, wait a minute, you're too far covenant of grace here? Okay, I think their the comeback would be, have mercy on me. You know, I have sinned. I am, uh, I am now a convert, and I believe everything that you're saying. <laughs> right. So, right. Wouldn't that be great? Yeah. Wouldn't that be great? That would be awesome. It hasn't ever I happened can't, to I can't me imagine yet. anything else, yeah. yeah. Exactly, exactly. Isn't that how your arguments go? No, it's kind of like that moment in Acts, right, where, where you know, you've got the guys that are like, oh, man, we're cut to the heart. We repent. If only that could happen with everything. But no, uh, yeah, what would their comeback be? I think probably, let's see, they might want to talk a little bit about the Genesis 17 thing, where there it seems like this, this covenant, it's not only this, it's, there's not only a breakability issue in play, but it seems like that you have Abraham, especially as you get on to, to later chapters 21, et cetera, where, where he's, you know, he's doing stuff and then being commended for his works. And it seems that this, this ongoing kind of reality for Israel depends on him and what he did there and his faithfulness and the, the situation with being willing to sacrifice Isaac and so forth, which is related to circumcision in that that's the knife judgment that it represents. Circumcision, I think, is a profound pointer to the cross because it, uh, it happened on the eighth day, number one. And there's all sorts of stuff to talk about there by way of uh, the seventh day kind of concludes history, but the eighth day br- brings in this, this renewed heart, this renewed creation. Uh, th- that's what's being uh, symbolized there. And, and then, of course, being cut away, the flesh, the, the body of sin, all of that's pointing forward to the sacrifice of Christ to bring in that eighth day reality. So uh, there is uh, a connection between what's then being typologically symbolized uh, in Isaac as Abraham is, you know, there's all sorts of amazing things going on with that moment. But then the angel stops him and says, right, because you have done all these things. And because, you know, and insofar as this is connected to this Abrahamic covenant, therefore, you know, you may know all of these things. So people get worried about that language and understandably so. And that was uh, an issue for me. I think what has really helped me deal with that, though, is to see it, the double layer of typology that's happening throughout the, the Old Testament. And um, I, I know of no one better to recommend there than Meredith Klein, in that he really just helps you to see whenever you've got Noah, for example, who's blameless in his generation and therefore saves the people from the, from the sure destruction. It's not like God's going, oh, yes, this is the, this is the actual Messiah right here. This is, this is him. And oh, actually, no, I'm just going to make this be a kind of salvation from the flood. No, what's happening there is very, very purposeful in pointing forward to what Jesus would do. But that doesn't take away at all from the fact that Noah, for example, is, is like a sinner completely. As we know, he gets drunk first thing in the new creation. Like he's a sinner saved by grace, right? But with all these guys, these major figureheads as you move forward, they, are, uh, they need to be thought of at two levels. The first level is that they're just like me and you. They're looking to the same Messiah. They're looking forward. We're looking backward. We're, we're all needing to be saved in exactly the same way and we relate to them at that level. 
But then they have this level going on in the Old Testament that we don't have. It's not true of us. We're, you're not a type of Christ. You're not pointing forward to him in the way that God is using you providentially and orchestrating history through your life. This is unique to them. And so this is because of this covenantal unfolding that's happening. And they become these people that, that, that foreshadow at, at another Adam that was promised. So for, especially with like Noah, for example, Lamech sees, his father sees him as the one that will bring rest. His name means rest. And so he becomes this kind of like, this, this one will show us what the, the promised savior is like. And so because he is blameless in his generation at this typological level, he then becomes the one who, can, through his works, constructs the ark that saves the people from the coming judgment and brings them into the, war, uh, to the new creation. It's a very vivid in the way that it points forward to what Jesus will do. Without losing any of his own sinfulness, he becomes this upper layer typology of, of what Christ will do. So, and then, and then, you know, there are all sorts of other sort of engineer East and things to bring in, but I don't want to complicate that right now. It's just that simple, actually, because by the time you get to Abraham, you're almost expecting uh, this dual layer typology to happen again and again. So you come to Abraham and you're asking, well, where's, where's the typology for Abraham? What, well, we see his, he's constantly, you know, chickening out and telling everyone that Sarah's, uh, that his wife is his sister. And, um, you know, we got the sinful elements, right? I don't have to tell you, you read through these guys, you, you, you connect very quickly with their sinfulness and, and you relate at that level. But then you have these moments where you see, oh, this is someone who is, because of this amazing work that he did, he therefore will bring about the typological reality that points forward to what Christ will do. So because of his work, it is true that he could be sure that there would be a people that would come from him, as, as the angel of the Lord says at that point, that would be Israel and so forth. But the covenant of grace is that, is that from that people itself will come forth the Christ. And, and this is the thing that's happening by grace alone. So you've got to, I think it's really helpful to think about this, this layer of typology that's developing. That's that God might use works to show how that secures the promise in the life of a particular figurehead, but that's, that's just a point to Christ and the undergirding thing that's being promised all the way through concerning grace. So I think that that's how we answer some of those, those uh, concerns, specifically as it relates to, to um, later sections of Genesis and Abraham and, and uh, circumcision and so forth. What else? Um, I don't know if you can think of anything that people might have to yeah. say. Does it factor that, you know, gen between Genesis 15, Genesis 17, there's been a significant amount of time has gone by, right? Yeah, yeah. So it's, 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 it's helpful it's, to think it's, about. It's a separate thing. Yeah, I mean, Baptists have played around with that a little bit. Like we've gone, okay, well, maybe you've got two separate covenants entirely. You've got like the works thing going on in 17. You've got a gracious thing going on in, in 15 and 12. And maybe there, it's almost like uh, what we're saying for Moses anyway, that, that later on comes a, a works covenant and that gets superimposed, as Paul says, on the gracious covenant in Galatians. So could that not have happened, happened even before with Abraham? And I think that's a, that's a good thing to raise. It's an interesting approach. I've just not been able to bring myself to actually see it that way because I think that when you have circumcision, it's been very clearly identified for Abraham as this thing that signs and seals and ratifies the Abrahamic covenant, right? For, it's, it's, so for him to, to all of a sudden, the, it's like bait and switch. And all of a sudden now we're talking about a, a works covenant based on, on the circumcision uh, sign. You might, I, I just don't think it would have been clear to them. I, whereas with Moses, it's very clear, right? Then we're taking that sign and we're saying, right now the typo typological offspring element has found its kind of a zenith here in, in the nation of Israel. And now you're in the land by grace, but now you keep it by works to bring out this, this works principle, I can see how that then changes the game a little bit very intentionally, so much so that Paul keeps referencing it to, uh, to it. But I still think what you mentioned there is helpful because, you know, it, we read these very quickly back to back and you go, oh, well, now it's grace, now it's works. And it's not really the case. I mean, certainly th there would have been a lot of time for this utterly gracious reality to permeate everything Abraham's thinking about, about his promises and then for him to respond the way that he does by taking Isaac to respond by doing these works that really we're still called to do in the new covenant. You have to respond. It's called evangelical obedience, right? You can't just, you know, we're saved by faith alone, but never a faith that is alone, as the reformers used to say. You're always having this produce the evidence of, of faith in, in our works. So I think as, as we reason that through by way of our obedience to, to our God, in the new covenant, I don't really see any problem just 
seeing that that was what Abraham was doing too. And that's, he's just responding to it. It just it had a slightly more breakable element to it because it was typological. And otherwise, uh, even beyond that, you know, God was actually singling Abraham out as this figurehead that, that points forward to Christ by his work. So that is, um, that is something unique to that situation that you also have to factor in. So I think that takes care of it, you know, for me. But I understand where people struggle, at least. You know, I am understanding like that. I am a pastor after all. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. So what's the practical import of this? Why do we care about the Abrahamic covenant? Hmm. Yeah, I like that question. That's good. That's good. Because, because, yeah, it does turn into a bit of a a hair-splitting theological squabble otherwise. Um, I think that one of the big things for me, why do I want to preserve this unity of the covenant of grace? I well, you know, I think that I like the way I'll just be upfront about this. I do like the way that it it keeps me basically in the arena of the reformed approach. This is not the main reason, but I do I appreciate that. Like I like not being I, I really appreciate reformed theology. I love what it has to say. I love what it's brought to the table. I love the way it brings in the unity of scripture. And I don't like theologies and theological systems that that divide things up and, and take away from that unity. So, so I realized that no one in the Baptist reform camp is really doing that. It's not, it's not trying to, you know, divide things in this hardcore dispensational way or anything, but it is still moving in the wrong direction when we start saying, okay, well, this is, this is not, they're, that they're not having this, the same covenantal experience of, of grace that we are. So I think, and I like being able to read the, the confessions and going, okay, well, we're all basically on the same page on this point. Uh, it's just, we're, we're squabbling about baptism a little bit. But that's understandable in light of uh, a more usual discussion around continuity and multiformity and so forth. But one of the things in terms of this unity thing is that you read the Old Testament, and I think it's just really powerful to see that it's not just that they were anticipating what was coming. They were actually experiencing a, a gracious reality through a typological administration of the theological covenant of grace. So here we are in the new covenant. They are they're in the, the Abrahamic covenant. Let's say if we're just focusing on those little bits. And how are we connected to those believers as we read through our Old Testament? Well, we might say, well, okay, they kind of pointed forward. They anticipated. They did all these things. But there's more. We're saying if there is a theological construct that overrides us or that overarches both of our historical covenants and our situations, then we read about believers there that have had through their particular typological signs and seals and sacraments and so forth, they have had an inbreaking of the same ultimate reality that we have. There is, uh, I love the way that Scott Clark uh, puts this. I think this brings it home in terms of application. Uh, he says the Abrahamic administration, or that the Abrahamic administration is a real historical, external administration of the covenant of grace to which Christ was promised and given to his elect by sola gratia. Sola fide is, is, is what the, the confessions are trying to drive home. And that's, that's it right there. That's what we want to try and preserve, this unity of the experience of the saints. Uh, later he says, God the Spirit was sovereignly operating within his people through the sacrifices, through the ceremonies, through the prophetic word, to bring the elect to new life and true faith in Jesus, the Messiah. So you read your Old Testament with that in mind, and there's just something that happens. There's a unity that happens. You feel like, I feel like as a pastor that's preaching every Sunday and using the Old Testament a lot, that's just, I mean, there's the, there's the application for the people in front of me. You know, we're, we're, it's just bouncing off the page. We're having the same, we're, we're in a different covenantal administration, but my goodness, it's, we're, we're one with these guys. And this, it just seems to unlock things about the experience of those things that bring about further application, I, I, I would say. Lee Irons, also one of my, my faves, says, as sacraments, the sacrifices, so think about, you know, you're reading through all your boring sort of like Levitical bits and, and trying to keep awake in your, in your Bible reading plan. Leviticus is the, the graveyard of all reading plans. You know, we all start, start off, we've all no doubt experienced the graveyard already at this point in the year. This is about when we get to Leviticus, right? Or a little bit after that. And uh, everyone bails out at this point because it's just all these like sacrifices. Why are these relevant? You know, what, what's going on? I'm a new covenant guy now. I don't care about any of this anymore. Well, as he says, the, as sacraments, it really helps to know the sacrifices were a real and efficacious means of grace to the elect Israelites. So when offered in faith, the benefits of Christ's atonement were applied to them by means of that type. And in this sense, the sacrifices actually mediated 
a present spiritual reality and benefit to them as Old Testament believers. Functioning in the inner core as part of a realized eschatology of the Old Covenant order. Whew, how awesome is that? This is why I like reading Lee Irons' stuff. I mean, that is just, you know, you can read that a hundred times and still not get to the bottom of it. The inner core of the realized eschatology of the Old Covenant order. Like, in other words, this whole thing that's come crashing into the New Covenant that we're currently dwelling in as New Covenant believers also crashed in through the inner core of this like thing that was happening through uh, the actual administration of the covenant of grace in the old covenant. So for me, uh, there is just a devotional reality going on there that a unity of the text that I, I love. And I want to try and preserve it as much as I can. I don't want to, if someone can show me why I'm wrong, that's a different story. And I'm, I'm sure that ultimately we can all get to this point, seeing that we all point to Jesus and I don't want to make it sound like, you know, someone else doesn't think that the Old Testament saints might have been saved by Christ or something. I mean, I know there are some people out there that don't believe that, but but leaving those guys aside, you know, basically within the reform cap, everyone's everyone's wanting to preserve that point. But it's a value then that this theology really highlights. And I like that. So I want to try and keep that if I can. Yeah, I really appreciate when you when you talk about the the typology and you're pointing back to to Christ and your explanation of this. It's so important. I, I was reading in Luke 24 this morning, where after the, the resurrection, you know, Jesus is, is coming to the disciples and he, he comes to them and he starts explaining to them, this is what I taught, this is what I taught you. And then it says, there's, there's this statement in there, he opened up their mind to understand the scriptures. All of a sudden, these, these puzzle pieces that they had, all of it just like started to, to ring true that Christ was in all of this. And, and that's the way the New Testament guys in. talk. They're like, and that was Christ. And that was Christ. And that was Christ. And, you know, it's, it's like they're going a little bit beyond just saying that was a picture of Christ. They're going, oh, there's a sacramental reality there. You know, that, that's, you were yeah. actually receiving the real Christ at that point. So, you know, yeah. I, and then <laughs> I know, wow. Talk about a biblical theology lesson. Imagine being around for that exposition. That would have been amazing. <laughs> but you could, you could only imagine how their minds would just... <laughs> You know, blowing up, <laughs> and so yeah, whatever we come up with, I think must be in line with that 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 is almost like assumption going on with Jesus at that point, and the way that he would have driven that home. So yeah, Amen. Uh, I think that's super important, and ultimately, anything that's just making Christ more vividly central to our whole theology is is I've yet to understand why that's a bad <laughs> thing. You know, that, that's going to mm-hmm. that's going to yeah. You know, that's going to be right. That's going to be what we're doing here on earth before we meet him. You know, that's that's the whole point. Mm-hmm. So we need to have our theology conform to that, not back away from that. Well, thank you so much for coming on today and, and helping us understand more about the, the Abrahamic covenant. We we really appreciate that and appreciate your time. Yeah, no, thanks. Great being with you guys again. And uh, yeah, hope, hopefully that helps someone out there. So we'll see. We'll see. Yeah. Maybe it fixed yeah. the problem. Maybe we're all on the same page <laughs> from this point on. I'm sure that this, this squabble you mentioned earlier is, is it's is done. Over. It's dead. Yeah. yeah. All right. Cool. So, well, I hope I, I hope I can still hang out with you guys, and you can t- you know you want to talk about some other yeah. things. You know, uh, you know. Yeah, now we'll have to have a diff- different different <laughs> subject. We're gonna have to yeah. come up with a different. Right. Yeah. So, all right. Cool, man. Awesome. All right. Thanks so much for coming. Hey, everybody. Thanks for listening. You can find more out about us or check out past episodes on the web at renewalcast.com. You can connect with us on social media. For instance, you can go to facebook.com slash renewalcast. Have a great weekend.